so I'm not alive. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to the forum. Um, Ron and I would uh, like to welcome you all and uh, pleased to see you, bearing in mind we've had virtually, well we only had four meetings since uh, February last time. So um, yeah, uh, just uh, got a bit of blurb here. Um, really very pleased to be reconvening this evening and it, for a lot of you it may well be the first forum meeting that you've come to so if that's the case then I've just got one or two little things that we uh, we do at the meeting first of all please can you keep the background noise to a minimum all right only speak one person at a time and not to speak over somebody else um, please keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking and then unmute when I call you to speak. And please indicate if you wish to speak by using the chat facility on Zoom by typing MIS, which is, as I'm sure most of you know, may I speak, and I'll call you to speak in turn. And please also type your name in the chat so that we have a record of who's attending. So uh, this meeting will be recorded and placed on the council's YouTube channel so people can view it afterwards if they wish. If you don't wish to appear, then just turn off your video. Okay. Um, if this is also the forum's AGM, so if anyone has nominations for the positions of chair and vice chair, please make these known now. We don't want them coming in partway through the meeting. Okay. Um, we have received one apology. Terry Taylor, have we heard from anyone else yet? No? No. Okay, then, right. So we're um, looking to for our update from the police. Have the police arrived? They have told us they're hoping to come. So. Hi, PC George Simpson here. Oh, hello there. Welcome. And I'll pass it over to you. Uh, so first of all, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I don't think I've had a chance to meet many of you at all, if any of, if any of you. Uh, my name is PC George Simpson. I'm uh, the beat manager here in Midsummer Norton and uh, Radstock. Uh, you may well know my colleague, uh, Mark Graham, who's been around a little bit longer than I have on, the, on this patch. Uh, I've been here since uh, February of this year, so still trying to get my head around it and uh, trying to get to know um, all the people I, I need to get to know. Um, in terms of uh, of an update, uh, I guess to a certain extent, I will be, be fielded by questions from you guys if, if you wish to provide any. Um, as you're probably all aware, COVID has come come policing wise is almost certainly come come to an end. That provided us with a very challenging uh, eighteen months or so, as it did so for many in the public sector as well. Uh, we are still trying to find our way through that and find our way to the our best way to describe it as the new normal. I think it was. Uh, Justin Trudeau, the Canadian uh, Prime Minister, quoted. Um, in terms of the crime statistics for the, the following, um, well, the previous three months, I'll just scroll down to my notes. Uh, we are, well, we're, we're running along as where we normally expect to do, in fairness. Um, we're averaging somewhere between 35 and 45-ish uh, crimes of uh, violence against the person a month. Uh, in terms of public order, we're running between um, sort of the low tens up to twenty uh, thefts. Uh, we're running from just a few, so four up to about fifteen, sixteen. Once again, when it comes to thefts, it can be very spiky because we can get uh, prolific theft from shop that can uh, skew the figures relatively rapidly and relatively quickly. Uh, in terms of arson and criminal damage. Uh, just a couple, uh, two through to about 10. Uh, burglaries were consistently below 10, ranging between three and eight. Uh, vehicle offences, we are reporting no more than, what, four of those a month. And uh, possession of offensive weapons, uh, the highest figure I've got for the last three months is two. Uh, these are these figures in comparison to uh, Peace Down St. John and um, Paulton Beat, which is our neighbouring beat, are, are pretty much exactly the same. A few, few variations, but on the whole, relatively similar and um, relatively where I would personally expect them to be compared to where I've, I've worked in other, in other beats. 
Uh, one area where we do seem to run quite high on is reports of antisocial behaviour. Um, we run at, uh, there was approximately 200, 240, 250 of those reported to us. Uh, vast majority of them uh, are relating to neighbourly disputes and neighbourly issues. And then the rest of the breakdown is being relating to uh, locations, groups and, and vehicles. But clearly neighbour disputes are our main sort of uh, driver of our antisocial anti -social, anti behaviour. Uh, in terms of um, some good news and good things that we've, uh, we've done in the last sort of couple of months, um, I don't know how, if you may have been aware, we had a prolific shoplifter over this side of town, or in Mittimer Norton and Radstock. Uh, she went on a bit of a, a thieving spree at local shops, supermarkets, those sorts of things. 25 offences in total we managed to get sufficient evidence for, and she's been reported for summons for those offences. And we'll be going to, due, going to court in uh, due course. Uh, date is still yet to be set. Uh, and I'm pleased to tell you that you may or may not know, back in March of 2020, a Misuse of Drugs Act warrant was carried out in the Withies over in Midsummer Norton. Uh, the gentleman associated with that warrant has recently been sentenced to four years imprisonment uh, and around about £40,000 worth of uh, Class A drugs were seized and taken off the street. So um, when the intelligence and the information is there, uh, we are able to act, we are able to sort of go out there and, and put the doors in and do a bit of old fashioned policing. Uh, happy to field any further questions if anyone has any. Um, Michael Evans, you wanted to ask a question? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, those figures that you've given us, uh, thank you for that, by the way, uh, that those figures, are they all per month, like 250 ASB per month? No, that's over the last three three months. Three months okay and the other figures were also for three months were they you seem to uh, give yes. a range yeah. yeah yeah but that was that was three months altogether will be four to sixteen thefts uh the, the figures are for the three a three month period so from uh seventh of what would it be seventh of Ju uh, july through to now so there were a, a, really a, roll, a roll, rolling figure ah oh, that's why there's the range because it's a rolling figure yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, just one question. Is, are there any extra measures being taken in view of this large number of uh, antisocial behaviour reports? And um, do we have anything specific on the criminal damage uh, in Minnesota and Norton at the weekend, the attack on the uh, memorial? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of, no one's made me aware of uh, damage to um, the more at Mr. Minorton. That's something I can certainly follow up on. Uh, and in terms of additional resources and additional thinking around um, the, the numbers of ASB instances. Um, we have taken on additional member of staff, and additional PCSO has joined the team, which will hopefully um, mean that we've got someone else out there trying to tackle, tackle these issues. That's good to hear, thank you. And I understand Eleanor Jackson would like a word. Hi, oh, yes, please. Um, I get the impression that you are extremely thinly stretched and and i was in fact wondering if you've got enough staff to cope with the uh, volume of problems on the ground i'm saying this because nobody has come to look at the vandalism at radstock methodist church that was reported to yourselves um and and um there's persistent problem with drug dealing in westfield but again reaction seems rather slow in spite of all the evidence that's been sent and I just wondered if you're so thinly stretched and I I do have to confess that when my lawn old lawnmower was stolen last week I thought well it's not worth yeah okay. um so and so in terms so much didn't even bother to report it and I wondered how many people same lines yeah um I'll pick up on your your final point there about um reporting or not, not reporting thefts, low level thefts of lawn mowers and garden equipment and that sort of that sort of thing. I, I would always encourage people to report a crime. It can be done online um, because it can be difficult to get through on 101 and certainly something like that is not a 999 call. The reason why I would say always report crime is because if we don't know about it, we can't target our patrols and target our resources accordingly. Um, you may have had your lawnmower stolen um someone else further down the road might have had it stolen 
but someone else may have had the information about who, what vehicle might have been involved and who was behind it. Now, without being able to join all those dots together, uh, our chances of, of returning your lawnmower to you would, would, would be zero. So I know, I, know, I know it's a pain, I know it's difficult to say, um, to, to take time out to report something like that, but if I'm honest, however small, it would be, it would be beneficial to us on a whole. Um, in terms of in terms of resources, um, it's been an immensely busy six to eight weeks over the summer holiday period, uh, and it's probably the busiest I've actually ever seen it in my 13 years as a police officer. Um, we're consistently running at unsustainable levels of calls to us. Is the honest answer. Um, and work has been done to, to put those, that right, and we have been working very hard to do it. Um, in terms of why specific things haven't been, people haven't come out to it, for example, the, 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 the um, damage to the Methodist, uh, Methodist church, honest answer is I don't know why someone hasn't been dispatched to that. Once you call the police or contact the police, it goes through a basic a screening process. And if they look at it and deem that uh, there is no lines of inquiry, it will unfortunately be filed at that source. So it won't actually get to either myself or my colleagues to come out and have a chat with you about it or find out what's going on. Well, I mean, the main thing is, of course, we got a crime number, yeah. um, which is, you know, will, ha will help with the insurance. And uh, what, but our, our problem is we think somebody has stolen the keys to get in because there was okay. no break in. And therefore, it's a question of changing the locks again. Yes. It's expensive, obviously. Yeah, no, I, I'm not sure. I know it's, it's very frustrating. Um, it, it, to a certain extent, it, it's, it's trying to identify what lines of inquiry you may or may not have around a crime. That's what the, the people, when these things come in, have a look at. Uh, and if there are lines of inquiry, then they will look to maximise our resources by, by, by giving those sorts of jobs out to two police officers or to PCSOs to follow up on. Unfortunately, if there aren't the lines of inquiry identified, then uh, there's a reasonable chance that it may be filed at source. Right, so um, would it be useful if Eleanor came to, uh, uh, you know, got in touch with you outside this meeting to take this? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd be very, you know, very useful. If, if the church is being particularly targeted and um, uh, having particular issues, then I, I would very much like, certainly for one of our PCSOs to go down and, and um, have a chat and try and um, identify what can be done. If there's any scope for um, inquiries or, or preventative measures through through our Bobby Van referral scheme or Home Safe as it's now called scheme to try and see what, what else can be done. Thank you very, thank you very much. And Liz, you have a question, Liz Hartman, and then we'll call it a day for this part of the uh, the meeting. I do. Thank you. Um, I know the numbers are very small. Um, you talked about two uh, offences with uh, offensive weapons in Portland, which is my ward. Uh, but bearing in mind that we have had somebody who was charged and I believe convicted of having firearms and I believe um, other terrorist equipment like bombs. W what was the context of these two um, people who were charged with offensive weapons? Was it some sort of like pub brawl or uh, have we, well, hopefully we don't have a little network of uh, a terrorist cell or something setting up in Portion. So thank you. Um, first of all, sorry, I, I don't have the specific details to hand of what specific cases are involved and the details of them. Um, the, these are just the headline things I've been able to acquire and put together. Um, uh, for, in terms of providing information, um, ultimately this is a public forum and I, I'll be reluctant to provide specific details of, of specific crimes. Oh, so to n no reply as such. Okay, thank well, you. I've got no information I can provide you. Okay, okay. thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming. I really appreciate uh, uh, when the police turn up, it, you never know, you know, what information you're going to get. So um, thank you very much indeed for coming. OK, awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Right then. So we move on to um, item three, the local plan partial update.
supplementary planning document consultations. And I would like to introduce Richard Down, who is the Deputy Head of Planning at Baines, to uh, give us a presentation, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm not sure whether it's Alison or, or it's, it's Sarah that's sharing the, the presentation. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so if you can go on to the, the next slide, please. So while, whilst we're, whilst yeah, we're sorry, doing Richard, that... Just, I, we're just a bit, uh, a bit of a delay, so just bear with me. Keep talking, okay. we'll, we'll do our best at this end. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. I'll make a, I'll make a start anyway. Um, so, yeah, I'm here really just to introduce and, and help uh, brief and, and publicise the, the planning policy consultations that, that have just got underway. Um, just as a very brief reminder before I go through the presentation, in terms of the planning system in this country, it's, it's what's called a, a plan-led system, which means that planning applications are determined in accordance with the local plan. So it's very important that the district has an up-to-date set of planning policies to uh, act as the framework for those planning decisions. The local plan is also supported by a number of supplementary planning documents which give further detail on, on specific policy areas. So next slide please, Sarah, if it's working. Yep. So just as I say, uh, consultation has recently started uh, and it runs through to the 8th of October. And we're, we're, we're consulting on four documents in parallel. So that's a partial update of the local plan and uh, the three supplementary planning documents or SPDs that you can see listed on the slide there. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. Thanks. Um, so just to start off with then, in terms of the, the local plan partial update, as the name suggests, we're, we're not reviewing and updating the, the whole of the plan, we're just updating parts of it. So that's parts of the core strategy and uh, the placemaking plan, which cover the whole of the district. Uh, the partial update is, is just focusing on some specific and urgent issues that we, that we need to address within Bath, North East, Somerset uh, quickly. So those issues are, are those set, set out on the, on the slide there. So principally it's around helping to ensure that uh, planning policies and planning decisions better address and better deliver on the climate emergency. So that includes uh, policies requiring uh, zero carbon construction. So that's zero carbon for both residential and employment uses. So that's really policies around minimizing the energy use within buildings um, and any use, any energy that is used within the operation of buildings that that wherever possible is provided through renewable energy. So things like um, solar PV cells on, on roofs of buildings. Um, we're also including policies that look to facilitate and encourage renewable energy generation. So that's both wind and freestanding uh, solar arrays. But that, what we're trying to do there is, is direct and focus the proposals to the most appropriate parts of the district based on seeking to minimise landscape harm and loss of important ecology. And then lastly, there's, there's quite a range of policies in terms of sustainable transport. So that's refocusing all of our policies and they very much focus on promoting the use of public transport, walking and cycling before considering uh, the use of cars. The next area of um, policies that, that we are uh, amending and updating relate to, again, helping to deliver the council's ecological emergency. So we're, we've strengthened a number of policies in the plan that protect habitats and species. And also importantly, we're now requiring biodiversity net gain. So at the moment, development is, is basically required to minimize the impact on uh, biodiversity. But in the future, what we're trying to introduce is that actually not only do they minimize that impact, but they actually deliver an increase in biodiversity. So what, what's called a, a net gain. And that's something that's been introduced nationally, but won't come into to play nationally until 2023. So we're, as a council, looking to bring that in more quickly. The other two areas, uh, the main areas of focus in the partial update are addressing the housing supply shortfall. So we, we're, at the moment, we're not able to show that we can meet 
the core strategy requirement. It's really important that we have enough sites and land to meet that requirement. The point at which we don't, uh, we start to lose control basically over where residential development will come forward. And we are uh, at risk, if you like, from predatory planning applications and, and planning appeals. And then the, the other area really is in terms of green recovery. So that's really trying to, to help facilitate economic recovery post COVID, but, but do that in a way that it's, it's promoting clean uh, and inclusive growth. So next slide, please, Sarah. So as I said, the partial update, you know, does include policies covering the whole of Baines, but there are some key implications for the, you know, for the Soma Valley area, which I'll just pull out now. So in terms of housing supply, um, most of the sites that we're identifying for development fall within Bath and within Kensham, but there are a couple of sites uh, in the Summer Valley which we're suggesting should be uh, allocated for development. The first is uh, the form of Poulton Printing Works, and that's the, the map in the bottom right hand side of the slide. Uh, and that's a site that's already in effect allocated for development in the old Baines local plan from way back in 2007. Uh, and it's really the parts of the site that, that still have uh, an outline permission for development, but the development has never been delivered. So that included elderly persons, uh, housing and uh, some employment uses. So what we're proposing there is to, if you like, reallocate those parts of the site, mainly to provide affordable housing, but also to help enable the delivery of an early years educational facility, which is much needed uh, in the village. Uh, as well as improved uh, green infrastructure and public open space. The other site that we're proposing to allocate is uh, Silver Street in Midsummer Norton. So that's a, that's a relatively small site, very close to the um, Norton Hill Free School. In terms of uh, economic recovery, two main issues around the South Road car park and the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone. So if you just want to go to the next slide, please. So very briefly, um, the South Road car park in the current adopted plan is allocated for provision of a food store, as, as some of you may well know. But we're actually now proposing to remove that food store allocation because it's acknowledged that the car park actually is important in its current role as a car park. So it should be retained as a car park because that helps to underpin, if you like, activity uh, and, and vitality of the town centre. However, we do feel there's still a need for uh, or the benefit of, a, of another food store close to the town centre in order to help underpin um, improvements improvements to the town centre and underpin um, you know shoppers continuing to visit the town centre. What we're proposing now is that that food store should uh, come forward on part of the the former Welton Bag factory site which is the area on that map shown in, in white just above the, the town centre. Um, so that food store would be part of a mixed use development um, on the southern end of the site. And we would also you know, want to make sure that there are enhanced, excuse me, enhanced connections through to the high street to make sure that people do make those, if they, you know, those link trips. So if they're visiting the food store, that they also visit the, the town centre. Next slide, please, Sarah, Tara. So in terms of the Summer Valley Enterprise Zone, um, Really, what the plan is trying to do here is, is it's trying to help facilitate delivery of, of much needed new employment space uh, and, and jobs in the Soma Valley. So the local plan will form the framework for uh, the local development framework or what the local development frame, what the local development order, sorry, will need to respond to. And that's a, an item later on the agenda. So the, the the site is currently allocated in the placemaking plan uh, and on that map it's the the site shown in blue so we are proposing some amendments through the partial update the first is to extend the site allocation boundary of the land to the north so that it coincides with the uh, enterprise zone boundary so that's the the red dotted uh, line so that would be included in the allocation and that will help facilitate the delivery of transport infrastructure um, as well as making sure it aligns with the enterprise zone. And then the other key change is, in addition to uh, industrial uh, and office uses, we're looking to enable other uses to come forward on the site. So that would include potentially food and drink, uh, offer a hotel and potentially some large 
format retail. Um, that will help to provide a greater mix of uses on the site and, and improve the place that's uh, created. But the important point to note here is that the local plan requires that any of those other uses that they must be shown to complement and not harm and not harm the town centre. So that's that's a really important point to make. Um, we're also introducing other policy requirements in terms of the enterprise zone around requiring zero carbon development and uh, again delivery of biodiversity net gain. Next slide, please. So just a, a, a little bit about where we are in the process. So the, the, the local plan partial update's gone through a number of stages. We're now at the draft plan stage. Uh, so just I think to make clear, this is a formal consultation stage. So any comments that we received, obviously they will be carefully considered by the council, but basically those comments are submitted alongside the plan, alongside the draft plan to the planning inspectorate so that then uh, we then move towards an examination before uh, an independent uh, government appointed planning inspector towards the end of this year, early next year. And then hopefully we'll be able to move uh, towards adopting the plan in the summer of next year. Next slide, please. So just very briefly on a couple of the SPDs and that there's an important differentiation here in terms of the consultation on the uh, SPDs that's a, a, a less formal consultation. So they're at a draft stage. So any comments we get back, um, the council has much more scope to be able to change the SPDs at this stage in, in response to those comments. Um, so the first SPD uh, is the Energy Efficiency Retrofitting and Sustainable Construction SPD, not a particularly um, snappy title, um, but this one again is, is aimed at helping to um, give positive uh, and useful guidance to homeowners and occupiers as to how they can retrofit energy efficiency measures to their homes, things like double glazing, air source heat pumps, uh, shutters. I mean, there's a whole range of measures. So that SPD, uh, you know, we've currently got an SPD, but we've basically updated the technological information in that. We've added new sections on uh, affordable warmth, and, and the hope is that that is now a much more positive guidance. But again, I would encourage people to go away and, and, and have a look at that uh, and provide us with your, with your comments. Um, the next slide, please. And then the other SPD I just wanted to briefly mention is in relation to transport and development. So again, this is very much aimed at um, sustainable modes of transport and, and again, addressing the climate emergency. So that includes uh, a section on parking. So that's both parking standards and the design of parking spaces. It includes guidance on uh, ultra uh, low emission or electric vehicle charging, uh, walking and cycling infrastructure design. So that's trying to make sure that footways and cycleways are accessible and safe uh, to use uh, in order to help encourage greater walking and cycling. Then travel plans guidance, that, that's really about sort of major, particularly employment developments and trying to make sure uh, that employers and, and new development, again, that that, you know, is, is focused on uh, public transport, walking and cycling rather than car use. Um, next slide, please. So very briefly, I'm pretty much at the end now. So just as a, a brief reminder, consultation on all of those documents from the 27th of August through to the 8th of October, there are a series of events, so we're going to all the forum meetings, but there's also a range of uh, webinars, topic specific webinars that people can, can join. Um, we would encourage people, if they can, to comment online and there's, there's, there's an easy to use uh, response portal and questionnaire on the website for people to use. But if, you, you know, if people haven't got access to a computer, then obviously they can send in paper copy comments. And then again, the, the, the address has been sent out to people. So we would, I, th I think just, you know, it's, it's almost a, a plea to you all really just to both comment yourselves on those documents if you have time, but also to encourage your communities to respond because we, you know, it's important as a council that we do hear the views of, of residents uh, and that we can respond to those and they can help, sh help shape our um, policy framework. Uh, so I think that's that's an end of the presentation. Uh, if, I've, if you've got any questions, more than happy to take those uh, now.
Right, well, we were going to have questions at the end, but um, if Liz would just like to uh, have a quick, quick one now. Um, it really is obviously about the Summer Valley Enterprise Development, as you can understand, which is important. And it may be this, this comes under the uh, further on down um, the agenda, but down the agenda, we're looking at the local development order, which is slightly different. So Richard, I think it's the second time I've, I've heard this. So and I don't think it will be the last, but if I could just say, obviously important, we are very concerned about the extra 85 homes being planned for the Pernell site. And we were, we, you know, we promised that more or less the 500 homes that we've, we've got would be it because schools, et cetera, infrastructure can't take any more. And we were, uh, the Outline Planning Commission was for a continuing care home. So uh, I don't think I can see any justification for not carrying on with continuing care home other than there's a shortfall within Baines, mainly, mainly met in Bath and um, in uh, Canesham. Um, and, and therefore, Porter has been asked to um, supply s s some more homes. So I just wonder, is that the justification? Um, no, I mean, the justification is, I suppose, well, threefold, probably. Firstly, the site is already allocated for development, um, including residential development. So, you know, it would be it would be likely to come forward for, for housing development anyway. Uh, and we feel by allocating in the plan, actually, we can secure a better a better type of development with more affordable housing and uh, other benefits as well. In terms of the elderly persons uh, accommodation, you know, the evidence was suggesting very strongly that that that, that isn't going to come forward and that isn't going to be delivered. Uh, and and you know, we've we've had that information given to us over uh, a number of years now. Um, and and in fact the you know, that scheme and the site was debated at the previous uh, examination into a local plan, um, you know, which was sort of three or four years ago. So um, we just felt it was better to have a, a, a beneficial use, use of the site. And I suppose the final part of the justification is this will provide much needed affordable housing, but also particularly uh, an early years facility, which, you know, is needed in the village now. Uh, and this is a means to helping uh, secure that. Chair, please could I ask a supplementary? Um, Richard, the only thing is this community asset, this um, nursery, um, it's already got planning permission and maybe the planning permission has lapsed, but that's already gone through. So I can't see why that, that would be a justification. Well, again, you really I, I agree it's got planning permission, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's going to come forward. Um, what we're hoping is that you know, in effect, by enabling some housing development, that will help to fund the provision and the implementation and the delivery of that of that early years facility. Because again, at the moment, it's got planning permission, but there's no evidence to suggest that that is actually going to be um, that it's actually going to be built. So, as I say, what we're hoping is the housing mm -hmm. development will help to 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 cross fund, if you like, and enable mm -hmm. that that provision to come forward. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Right, I'd like to come in now. I, we do have some other people who've asked to ask a question, but if we can go to the end of um, all the uh, presentations. Uh, yes, presentations and ask the questions at the end, if you don't mind, please, it'll just work better because some of you might find that your questions are answered by other people, hopefully. Okay, so um, if we can, I'd like to move on to item four on the agenda which is the Wecker Transport Corridor Improvement Project and introduce Phil Wright to you, who's the Public Transport Programme Manager at the West of England Combined Authority. Thank you, Chair. Um, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you for letting me come along and speak to you tonight. Um, I had been hoping to come and give you a formal presentation tonight and tell you that we had gone live on our early engagement uh, for, for the corridors linking the Summer Valley into both Bristol and Bath. Unfortunately, we're slightly behind where we are, so I'm going to give you a verbal update uh, with, with further information to follow, which I'll share once the links are available. And I'm very happy to come back to any future meetings if you should wish me to come back and give a more detailed uh, presentation at that point. Um, so just a quick update that uh, the chair's introduced me very well. And um, 
I'm, I'm leading a wider programme of works right across the, uh, with the West of England area uh, to look at all of the main, main corridors and a slight misnomer, some of those corridors include rural areas, which aren't really corridors, but um, they come later in the programme because obviously the main driver at the moment is, uh, is excuse the pun, um, is trying to get people um, travelling along the main corridors in a more efficient way. Um, so what are we looking to do? So we are looking at the, let's say, the links on the primarily the A37 and the A367, linking the Summer Valley into both, both Bath and Bristol. Um, and we're looking at how can we how can we make it more natural for people to choose something other than the car? I think we can all accept at the moment that the easiest thing to do is walk out your house, jump in the car and, and make, make that journey, be it half a mile or 20 miles or 200 miles. Um, how can we start to change that so that we can encourage people to make the journeys they can make by other means uh, more easily than they can at the moment? Um, whilst you know we, we completely accept that there are people who have to make journeys by car and that's fine you know cars are perfectly acceptable mode of transport but i guess what we want to do is try and encourage people and provide the infrastructure for people to make a journey by means other than the car where, where possible so how are we going to do that so we're looking at improving the bus services primarily for me it's about building the infrastructure that make them faster more efficient and ultimately cheaper for us to to use um, and Part of that get a better bus network as well, which means that we can use the bus to make journeys we can't necessarily do at the moment. Um, we want to improve those walking and cycling links. Um, how can we get people traveling around their local area in, in a more efficient way, on a more comfortable way, or uh, not, not necessarily on a on a high, high volume traffic road where they may feel uncomfortable doing that? Um, and I think it's especially about how do we get people, certainly in some of the, the villages around here, that to get them connected to the corridors, um, because some of those villages are off the corridors and they don't necessarily have good access at the moment. Um, how can we make sure we connect those communities better to those more high frequency corridors? Um, so what do we intend to do? So this is what we are at, what is called, um, it's actually just changed its name. It used to be called strategic outline business case. It's called the strategic outline case um, level now. So we're at the very early stages of the development of the scheme. And what we're doing at the moment is looking at what options we have. And uh, uh, this is the stage where hopefully we can come to people like yourself, but also the wider community to help us to shape those options. Um, what we really want is to input um, broad principles, but also the nitty gritty of uh, this crossing point is terrible or uh, this bus stop is really badly located or whatever it may be. We, we really want to get that local knowledge, that local information to make sure that we build that into further uh, to the design of the scheme so we, we can take it for the later stages. So the timescales we're looking at at the moment is we're, we're hoping to go live um, uh, later next week, uh, just waiting for final sign off on that. It will be initially a web based portal with um, an ability to be able to uh, get some background information about the scheme a bit more detail than I'm necessarily given here um, and also complete a survey form which will hopefully will feed into those options for us. Um, that's due to uh, end at the end of November we'll be submitting that for approval um, so during 2022 we'll be going through uh, more detailed work looking at taking those options and putting them into uh, real designs um, and putting them back in front of you at that point, hopefully to say, hopefully this meets your needs and uh, this meets your aspirations um, and you'll have another chance to help us shape it at that point. Um, and that's likely to be summer 22 if I was a betting person, but at the moment, obviously there's a little bit of a little bit of flexibility around that. Um, and then we like to be in the stage in 2023 where we'll be doing what's uh, called the statutory consultation. One of my colleagues there was talking about planning uh, this was there may be some planning elements to it but it more likely to be around traffic regulation orders so there'll be a chance to input at that stage um, and then we'd uh, I, I keep using this phrase so I'll use it again um, first spade in the ground in 2023 to, 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 to start to commence uh, building the interventions I guess that gives me quite a lot of scope to flexibility on a 12 month time scale there um, so it's um, yeah, it's it's a fairly quick time scale. I guess that's the impression I'm, give, I'm, I'm going to give you. Um, it might not feel it, but I guess in a in a developing a a, a quite a substantial scheme, um, looking at two years is is quite quick to, to get through from where we are now to starting to physically build something. So I guess what I, I guess I just want to just stress that it's it really is about how can we help you to travel around 
by means other than necessarily just jumping in the car to that journey while still being able to make the car for the journeys that you need to make it for. Um, and there are loads of different ways we can do that. And we will put more information around those on the website once we have that information available. I appreciate it's a quick update and I do apologize that I haven't been able to uh, come and bring it to you. I, we had hoped to be live by now, but I thought it was useful for me to just come and give you the heads up, early heads up that something will be coming shortly. Like I say, I'm happy to come back should you wish to, to invite me back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, we'll come back at the end of the presentations. If anyone wants to ask you a question, we'll be back with you. Um, and it's now over to Ron, who's going to uh, carry on from here. Okay, Ron. Hello, everybody. Um, a lot of you will have not come across me before. I'm a local businessman that does most of my business in Birmingham. Apologies to WECA and their transport policy. Um, but um, I was elected as vice chair of this uh, forum. And then about three weeks later, before I'd even got the chance to hold Linda's hand, um, down came COVID. And our officers, our regular officers, did the right thing, pulled all the right plugs. And so, to be honest, I've never chaired a meeting before. Uh, but I have a lot of experience of cha chairing Zoom meetings over the last two years, believe me. Um, so welcome to everybody from me, um, and uh, let's hope we'll see a lot more of each other in the future. Um, I've got to introduce now um, Richard Samuel, Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Economic Development and Resources, and Simon Martin, Director of Regeneration, um, who are going to introduce this item next to us, which also includes three presentations by Bain's officers. So over to you, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you Ron. Um, <clears throat> well, I just want to say it's quite a good point to come in, really, because uh, the, uh, the transport corridors that uh, Phil Wright has just mentioned are actually part of a tripartite set of policies going through the West of England Combined Authority at the moment. Uh, so th there is the transport investment, uh, the, the WECA is preparing work on the, the, uh, its plan for the area, uh, it's a sustainable development strategy, and of course we have a climate emergency that all councils in the WECA area have declared, and all these things come together, they're all indivisible, and they all work towards or should work towards the same ends. So I just want to say a little bit of, uh, before we go into more detailed presentations uh, about where I'm coming from on this. So uh, within the council, I took over responsibility for economic development in May from Councillor Tim Ball, uh, who'd carried out, carried out that job for the previous two years. And as you might expect, coming into a new role, uh, somebody, somebody like me will look at something uh, in a different way, quite possibly. So I'm not at the point of changing things at the moment. Uh, I'm trying to absorb what work has gone on, what purpose it's leading towards, but one thing I'm already very clear on is that the council needs to refresh its approach to economic development across the district. Uh, the last strategy the council produced was in 2014. It's well out of date now. And uh, we need to uh, look at that again, particularly as the combined authority has arrived on the scene since we last had that strategy. And the combined authority has a lot of resources and money uh, potentially to help with the tasks that we've got. For me, uh, and looking at the Summer Valley particularly, there is no point in doing transport investment unless it needs, leads to sustainable economic growth locally. There is no point in having a fast travel corridor to Bristol or Bath if all that does is encourage people to use their cars more. So one of the challenges will be whether we can, whether Weka uh, and ourselves can come up with a, um, an approach to particularly public transport that is timely, affordable and reliable. And at the moment, uh, the bus services in North East Somerset are, neither, are none of those. Uh, the bus services in our area are generally too expensive. They're not always timely, uh, as we know, and often there are not late night services and they're not always reliable. So there, there is a big challenge there. And I know that uh, the Command Authority is going to look at the, the bus network in the West of England. Um, so 
that's kind of what I'd preface things really. Um, in terms of the specifics you're going to hear about, the, the work in Midsummer Norton, the Enterprise Zone and so on, um, these are there to be shaped in some shape or form, although of course we've been doing work on these for some time, but uh, I expect in the autumn I will have to make some final decisions on the way forward and you know today what would be really useful is to hear from you uh, what you think about where we are at the moment and whether there is room for improvement. So. Um, Ron, that's what I, that's all I'd like to say by way of introduction. Now we hand over to Simon and his colleagues. Thank you, Richard. I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Simon Martin. I've been appointed to the post of Director of Regeneration and Housing, which covers a range of place-based services. And the Council's, um, through COVID, been through quite a lot of reorganisation. So we've drawn together our economic development, business and skills, housing, um, regeneration and environment services under one area, um, primarily as Richard's discussed, with the aim of shaping and really providing a new focus and emphasis towards um, meeting your local aspirations uh, and starting to develop our plans to get the best out of investment. And there is um, post COVID and as, as we've migrated through from a COVID response where we've supported something like four and a half thousand businesses through about 60 to 70 million pounds of grant funding to support those businesses through to recovery and some of the work we're going to present today around the high street, love high streets and, and the COVID recovery grant funding that we've been using to support those initiatives through to future funding. I think what we're really keen to do is to engage in a different way and start to develop a much more strategic sort of approach to how we link together the investment opportunity and how we bring that to bear to deliver some very real outcomes locally. So I think what, what I'd like to offer or proffer is that through these pres presentations, please, please don't see them as fixed, fixed points that are um, not open to opportunity and discussion. Uh, and moving forward, we're really keen to engage in that discussion, perhaps more proactively and productively than, than we have um, in the past, given that, you know, COVID has really changed the emphasis and, and created a lot of opportunity coming out the back of it. So hopefully today's presentations will give you an update of some of the live projects and some of the investment that is currently going on down in particularly Midsummer and Autumn. Um, and from that, then we can have a broader discussion around what the future opportunities might present and how we might um, help to realize some of those local aspirations. So I think I'm handing over to, um, I think, Richard or Ed um, to go through the Heritage Action Zone and Love High Street work stream that is currently on site and also then an update on the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone. Yeah, um, uh, we, Simon, you are handing over to Ed. So Ed, um, over to you for your presentation on the uh, Heritage Action Zone, please. Yes, hi everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Bill, got some nodding heads. Hello, it's really nice to see everyone and there's a lot of familiar faces here. Um, so it's very good to be here and thank you for letting me uh, speak to you today. I've just been asked to give an overview of um, the Midsummer Norton High Street Heritage Action Zone. So I've got a short presentation to uh, present to you. Now, I know that some of you, or a fair few of you actually, will have already seen a lot of this information now and are actively involved in the project, which is great. Um, so please feel free to um, uh, chip in at, at any point if, if needed, but otherwise I'll take questions uh, once the presentations are, are finished. Um, can I just check that the share screen option is available? Yeah, it is, it is Ed. You should be able to share your screen now. Fantastic. Um, can you all see this? Yeah, right. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Um, so, uh, yeah, just in terms of introductions, my name is Ed Heritage. Uh, I joined the council uh, at the back end of last year. I previously worked as a heritage and planning consultant. And I've joined the council as the project manager for the Midsummer Norton High Street Heritage Action Zone. Uh, so, as I said, I've met lots of you already and I've been doing a lot of work with the community uh, and uh, the other stakeholders. This is very much a community-led uh, project 
So it's very much uh, not my job to kind of take over or um, say what we're doing uh, in minute detail. It's very much to uh, facilitate the community being able to do that and also um, kind of bring on board ideas and people in the know because as has been previously mentioned, it's very much about uh, local knowledge and local people. Uh, that's what I'm here to, to do. So um, a kind of general overview of the project uh, and the funding that's available. Uh, it's about 2.21 million pounds in total. Uh, we've been very fortunate to be supported by a lot of organizations, including Historic England, uh, the West of England Combined Authority. Uh, there's some council funding there as well, and also some money from the town council and the community trust. And we've also recently been awarded some additional funding from the European uh, Regional Development Fund uh, and also Historic England Cultural Programme, uh, which is very much for uh, community events and activities. In terms of capital works, the kind of overarching Objectives of the scheme are a new multi-use square, uh, market square at the island, improvements to the town hall and adjacent shop fronts, uh, improved pedestrian links between the high street and south road car park, and also uh, additional high street shop frontage and signage improvements alongside um, community uh, events and activities. These are some of the um, activities and projects that are going ahead. Uh, it's quite dense, but I'm, I will send across the presentation after uh, the meeting. So that you can kind of get a flavour of, of uh, the things that we're trying to achieve. But they're broken down into sort of five categories, which is public realm improvements, so that's the island, uh, what we're calling the old brewery walk, which is the south road access between the high street and the car park, and also the reinstatement of the market hall at the town hall. Uh, there's shop front improvements, um, for which a lot of work has been done already. There's high street improvements, including heritage asset repairs, um, and we're looking to bring in pop-up shops and window displays and also urban greening. Uh, and then there's community engagement aspects, which is, in, in my opinion, the most important one, which is very much about uh, co consultations, workshops, exhibitions, co-creation, working with local partners, and also making sure that we're adequately communicating that uh, to the community and also getting feedback on that. And then there's also the cultural programme, which is, uh, as I said, a term for um, the inclusive community events and activities programme that we want to run. We're also going to be appointing a dedicated engagement coordinator who will oversee kind of high street engagement and particularly uh, market program. Now that's actually out for uh, recruitment now. So um, there's, that's been run by, uh, by the, the Midsummer and Autumn Community Trust uh, and there's information on their website and also on their social media channels. We are sort of struggling at the moment to get applications through. They'll be open for another week or so, but I'd really encourage you to to um, get that out there and I can provide you with some more information and the job advert and uh, the uh, job description um, uh, in due course um, because it'd be great to get that person appointed to really kick on with the events and activities with the community trust. Um, this is an overview of the Capital Works projects that we've got going on. Um, the, the big one for us at the moment is the Market Square, that's in full flow. Uh, and that will be to, to create a new multi-use market square, uh, reinstate the market hall and the town hall and the shop front uh, to be able to run community events and activities and markets and also, you know, spruce up, up the island, which is not in a great condition at the moment. Um, the second one is the Old Brewery, Old Brewery Walk, uh, South Road Access, which um, for those of you who live in the area and visit regularly, is, is, you'll know is not in very good condition. And then there's a general has wide, what we call has wide improvements, which are for um, heritage assets, uh, greening, pop up shops, community engagement and activities, and just generally uh, regenerating the area. Um, so, as I said, we've been working through the Market Square proposals. We had a, a community consultation, consultation that was undertaken in December 2020, and we'd actually had loads of pre consultation meetings with uh, the community beforehand and also the, the HAS steering group. And I know there's lots of you here already, so thanks for listening to me again. Um, that was really successfully, successfully received. Um, we've been since doing some technical work and particularly working with uh, our highways team within Baines to make sure that this multi-use aspect of maintaining access to businesses, uh, loading for, for businesses, uh, public realm improvement, you know, public open space to be enjoyed, particularly for markets, and also actually looking at the bus stops. Uh, and the kind of business of the um, High Street, Silver Street route. Uh, so we've been working through that and, and we'll be releasing kind of more uh, finalized designs in due course. Uh, these are some of the concept um, plans that we've got. You'll, you'll see that there's a kind of everyday parking and general use 
uh, that provides additional um, public realm and open space for people to enjoy as opposed to just being very vehicle dominated. There's a loading option there, so uh, providing a dedicated loading bay. And then also kind of a mixed, mixed use scheme that is both markets and parking. And then on a certain days uh, for large events and large markets, um, we can kind of pedestrianize that space on a temporary basis whilst maintaining access uh, so that we can really show off uh, Midsummer and Autumn, uh, the island, and also the area uh, nearer the town hall. The town hall itself is part of the proposals. Um, we've got roughly £335,000 allocated for the reinstatement of the market hall. There's a much wider town hall transformation project, um, complete refurbishment that's going on. So I'm working very closely with uh, the town trust, the town council, uh, to bring those um, uh, those designs and, and permissions to fruition um, and we'll be working with them uh, in the next uh, couple of years to, to be able to bring that forward as well. South Road Access, um, it's, it could be a really, really good space, uh, but at the moment it, it's just, um, it's a bit run down uh, and it's struggling a little bit, but it's so heavily, heavily used as people move from the car park uh, on South Road to um, the high street that we really should be doing something about. that. So we'll be bringing forward improvements there as well. Uh, and we're really pleased to be working with some amazing uh, landlords and owners who are really excited about the potential of this area, uh, particularly uh, towards the South Road car park side as well. And we're looking to um, uh, sort of introduce meanwhile uses, community hub, um, and also public realm improvements in that area. And then there is the shop fronts and signage improvements. Uh, you'll see some examples from the centre of, of uh, the city in Bath here. It's been really successful in the centre of, of town and, and we're really keen to introduce this in Midsummer North and uh, get people excited about those shop fronts and some of the vacant units that are available at the moment. We've had some success already. Um, we've been speaking to potential shop owners uh, and businesses and landlords and that, you know, even just the conversations we've had so far have generated interest that we'd like to uh, take a more formal uh, concerted effort to um, reanimate those spaces and also open them up for community use and get people excited for, for those spaces so that hopefully they take on they can be uh, brought into long-term uh, lets and, and taken on fully. We've undertaken a really really detailed high street shop front and facade study so we've actually looked at every building on the high street and within the heritage action zone uh, that predates 1960. We've produced uh, property property sheets for them, which include a list of suggested actions. Uh, and we are introduced or have launched a, a small grant scheme to be able to um, help um, shop shop front um, uh, shop front and, and shops and, and landlords bring forward improvements. Uh, and that's been released and will be kind of publicised more widely. But we've again had really constructive uh, conversations with. Uh, with people already and you should be seeing some shop front improvements coming forward in the next year or so which is great. Uh, we've also been awarded cultural program funding of £85,000 for community events and activities so that's on top of the funding we've already been awarded. As I said previously that imp uh, includes a salary for a position uh, which is two and a half days a week which is for the engagement coordinator which we're currently recruiting for. We've just been given £183,000 additional funding from Historic England for uh, upgrades of materials at the island. Um, Historic England are great supporters of ours and they're really keen to see this area improve uh, and they've put their money where their mouth is, which is great. And then we've also been allocated some money from the Welcome Back Fund, uh, specifically for a community hub uh, and temporary toilet facilities, which are, are much needed and we really want to support. Uh, I think that's... Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, it kind of gives you a, a flavor of an a overview of, of what we're doing. As you can tell, there's quite a lot going on uh, and the community are really getting behind it, which is, has been fantastic. And we really want to um, kind of lift up people within the community uh, and kind of publicize the good things that people are doing already um, uh, and, and kind of bring all of those networks together uh, because there's, there's so much stuff going on. Um, that we think is fantastic. It's just about how do we make sure that come, all of this stuff come forward, comes forward coherently and benefits everyone, even those we, who might be on the sort of fringes of our community. So thanks very much. I'm uh, very happy to take um, questions after the presentation has been finished. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um,
got to say, you've got a wonderful name for the job you're doing. Absolutely tremendous. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll be, Thanks, Ron. We'll, okay. There will be questions afterwards. So yeah. um, if anybody could get them ready um, and let the ladies know by, by uh, pressing your speak button, um, we'll get to them very shortly after these presentations. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. So um, it's Richard Holden again. Just wanted to introduce um, Kevin Hunt, who is a director at Jones Lang LaSalle, and Ed Whitney, who is a director at Arcadis. They are going to um, uh, give a run through of a presentation. It is quite swift, I have to say, a run through of a presentation on the local development order that um, Richard Dayon has already mentioned that we are looking to deliver or you're looking to utilise to, to enable delivery of the um, uh, economic intervention at the Summer Valley Enterprise Zone. So um, I will hand over to uh, Kevin uh, now. Thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I will take you through, a, as Richard said, a fairly brief presentation today, but I'll talk at the end of this session about um, some further engagement that we'll be doing over the coming weeks and months. Um, can I go on to the next slide, please? Um, thank you. So, yeah, I will do a brief introduction in terms of what an LDO or local development order is, um, how that fits into the planning policy context. Um, and then I'll, I'll take you briefly through the, um, the, the scheme development and the illustrative master plan, um, look at some of the benefits of the scheme as we see them. And then, and then as I said, look at next steps and future consultation. Uh, next slide, please. And again, please, thank you. <laughs> um, so th this is very much the start of, um, of our consultation around the um, Summer Valley Enterprise Zone local development order. Um, there will be um, further consultation over the, the coming weeks, but there will also be a formal and statutory consultation once the LDO is prepared. Um, at this stage, we are very much working to, to prepare it, to understand what works on the site, and of course, to seek views of the local community, which is why we are really keen to, to be here tonight and over the next few weeks to hear your input. So um, this stage of consultation is really important from my perspective because it allows us to hear your views and that can inform the design as, it, as we move it forward. Um, yeah, as I said, so your, your comments will then inf inform that design development. Um, next slide, please. So a local development order um, is effectively a form of a planning permission um, on, on a defined site, which um, defines the type of development, the type of uses, um, and the amount of development that can be built. Um, and the reason local development order is, is important and um, really, really supported in planning policy is because once it is in place, it allows investors or developers um, to, to come on site more quickly and to use a phrase that's been used earlier tonight, to, to put shovels in the ground and start to, to develop um, buildings which helps to support economic development and jobs. So the, L the LDO is formalised through the planning process and is subject to this consultation. But once it exists and once it's been adopted, it enables um, quicker um, commencement of construction um, and therefore is a real benefit when we're looking at economic recovery and, and growth within the Summer Valley. Um, next slide please. Um, Richard um, Dane in his earlier presentation touched on this but just to confirm so that the site has been allocated for um, employment related uses for a number of years um, and that allocation will be carried forward as part of the local plan partial review uh, with some amendments to that allocation to change the extent of it as you saw on the plans from uh, from Richard uh, and to include a slightly wider range of uses which might include um, food, drink, hotel and, and some retail um, and, and the work we're doing very much seeks to align with that, that emerging policy position. Um, next slide please. Sorry, and, and again, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we've been working on this on this site for um, a good number of months now. Um, and back in March 2021, we submitted a formal pre-application inquiry to Baines as the local planning authority. Um, and as part of that exercise, we also presented our scheme to an independent design review panel, uh, which is very much designed to, to help inform um, our design development process. The reason we went through both those exercises was to get um, get formal and independent input on the on the type of scheme that we were bringing forward and how that scheme might work uh, on the ground and, and link into um, the urban context and the uh, and landscape and what impact there may be on on local communities. Some of the conclusions that came out of 
that um, that engagement with the planning authority and design review panel focus very much on on things like sustainability biodiversity net gain um, landscape but also distinctiveness of, of placemaking and the design approach um, one of the key factors that came out from that consultation and, and this came from the design review panel was thinking about how the buildings that might be developed on summer valley sit within the landscape um, and an idea has emerged about thinking of a, a, a business park within a park, within a parkland landscape. Um, and as you'll see, as we move on to the next, next stage, that's very much influenced how we have sought to design this scheme. So you can go on to the next slide, if, if you may, thank you. Um, so so all, all of that input from the planning authority, and, and there was lots of consultations with statutory consultees, so transport, um, heritage, and so forth, has all, inf all informed this version of, of our illust illustrative scheme. Um, and to, just to pause there, the reason I talk about this as an illustrative scheme is because it shows how we think the, the local development order could be delivered. Um, but that local development order will have some flexibility in, in it. So within a defined framework, which identifies plots, development plots and structural landscaping, there will be flexibility as to how the actual buildings might be orientated or designed, but that will always be set within a very fixed framework and that's why this we think this illustrative master plan is helpful because it shows you how we think it may be delivered in the future um, first of all thinking about the landscaping you, you can see there the extent of, of green landscaping throughout the site in fact over 30 percent of the site um, is, is set over to, to structural landscaping um, and that helps us with things like sustainability and biodiversity net gain uh, but also help helps to um, to mitigate any impact of the development and, and really set it off in, in quite a unique way of having that extent of landscaping within a um, within a local development order um, enterprising site um, I touched on sustainability just now. We are very much seeking to align with the council's direction of travel on sustainability. So net zero carbon, 10% uh, biodiversity net gain um, and renewables. So, so consistent with the approach that Richard Bain um, explained to you just now. Um, in terms of building heights, um, typically we're looking at building heights for about two stories. Um, some of the plots along the frontage, so um, you will see the, the a new roundabout introduced to the south. Um, those plots there, so plot uh, two, which is the hotel, and plot five, those three um, dark, um, dark blue um, buildings could be up to three stories in height, but predominantly across the rest of the site up to two stories. Um, and then in terms of um, the type of uses we're talking about here, um, so I can't, I can't show you on some screens, I haven't got my mouse, which I would typically do for these presentations, but hopefully you can see the, the P numbers on the buildings, which identify plot numbers. So um, starting from, from the bottom by the roundabout there, plots one, two, three, and four are um, largely retail, leisure, and food, um, and, and a hotel. So, so plot P2, the red one being, being a hotel. We think that's really important to, to introduce that mix of uses as part of this scheme. Um, in part, they provide amenities for the, for the wider um, occupiers of the site. So if you're coming to work on this site, there will be some amenity offer, which avoids you having to travel um, away and, and, and create, and create some, um, some, I suppose, part, some identity on the site itself. Um, but that, those, those uses are also higher value and therefore help to support the viability of the overall scheme. Um, and indeed contribute to the mix of jobs. Um, and I'll come on to talk about the, the other types of uses in a minute in terms of that mix of jobs that's on offer. Um, and then across the rest of the site, um, if we look at the, uh, the, the that central spine road uh, and beyond that plots um, five and six, they are predominantly office and flexible business space. And then as we move up to the north of the site, we get into more traditional employment type uses. So offices, uh, general industrial and uh, distribution. So, so the, the dark blue larger rectangle P10 is a distribution space. So this scheme therefore provides a real mixture in terms of um, types of jobs, um, lots of traditional employment, but also lots of modern employment in terms of office and flexible space, uh, really seeking to maximise um, opportunities for people to come in and invest and create that economic uh, development and, and investment. Um, the, the, the final part that we wanted to touch on today was about our approach to transport um, and accessibility. And I'm going to ask my colleague Ed to then come in and talk, talk you through a few slides on how that transport strategy is working. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Kevin. If you could move on to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so, so on the subject of uh, transport in relation to the LDO for the Enterprise Zone, 
it's clear that uh, in order to bring forward the site in an appropriate manner, it's essential that we support sustainable travel. Uh, and in order to do so, we need to introduce a number of measures which, which actually encourage people to travel uh, using uh, at the top of the hierarchy, walking and cycling at modes uh, but, and, and also by bus with the, with the private car obviously being, being a functional uh, transport mode, but uh, by no means the, the preferred uh, means of access to the site. So um, we also need to prepare a transport assessment which addresses the issues that might be caused by vehicular travel to and from the site. And that transport assessment will be, and I say will be because it's a very much a work in progress at the moment. We are developing um, our thinking around uh, the development of this site. Um, that transport assessment um, is being defined through our scoping discussions with the local highways authorities. Um, and in, in that instance, we, we're referring to Bath and North East Somerset highways officers, but also Somerset um, highways officers. Uh, we've also engaged with First Bus, and as Kevin mentioned, with, with Design West. Um, so the transport assessment, as I say, will be a comprehensive document which, which both reviews the impacts of the scheme in traffic terms, but also encourages um, people to travel sustainably. Uh, and the inputs into that assessment um, include, as you can see on the slide, uh, traffic data collection at a number of locations. So they're in the, in the red circles um, on, on the plan, but also our observations on site and an audit of, of accessibility through the study area. Um, by bicycle, um, by traveling on foot, uh, by bus, and, and also for HGVs as well, noting that, that some of the land uses will may, may generate some HGV traffic. Um, so I think if we move on to the next slide, we can just look at some of the issues that that transport assessment is, is seeking to address. So at the top of that table, we've got some icons of uh, the cyclist, a, a pedestrian, and, and an EV. Uh, charged car. So in order to encourage um, access by sustainable modes, th there's a number of different measures that we would introduce. First among them would be the um, bringing forward of a travel plan, which enc encourages behaviour change towards sustainable travel for people visiting the site and also working at the site. The construction or rather enhancement of a walking and cycling route that's about 1.2 kilometres to the Norton Radstock Greenway, um, bringing in the, the right levels of EV charging facilities on site and carefully calibrating the amount of car parking um, within the within the curtilage of the site so that we both um, ensure there's no overspill elsewhere into the surrounding area, but also without encouraging too much um, private car use. Um, the, the site itself will be designed to be walkable and cyclable and, and some of the illustrations we've seen before um, have indicated the planting and, and the road widths that support that. Um, we also expect to improve the bus facilities um, on, on the road outside the site um, with, with enhanced waiting facilities, real-time information where possible, and improving crossing points so that it's easier to cross the A362. Um, and finally, the last two rows on that table uh, relate to motor traffic and the private car we recognise the A362 and the wider network is, is a busy network. Um, but at the same time, we, we recognise that there's going to be traffic congestion um, with or without our scheme. And so we need to find the right level of mitigation um, to where necessary improve and increase the capacity of the road network to, to make sure that the impacts of the proposed development are not severe and are not detrimental. And so that's that's one of the key outputs of our transport assessment, which I say is underway, is what are the measures we need to bring forward to support the development of the site and make sure that traffic isn't too, too disadvantaged. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, it, this is just a, an illustration showing where some of those key uh, emerging improvements might be. Um, you can see the, the 
to the, to the left of the of the drawing, we have the potential junction improvement on the A thirty seven, um, uh, moving from left to right, potentially introducing speed limit consistency through Farrington Gurney, um, an opportunity to um, remove the pinch point at Sunnyside, which requires traffic to give way uh, to to oncoming vehicles uh, and and around the site, which is in the red line area to the right of the drawing there's also um, proposals to straighten out the um, a362 alignment making it safer and also providing safe access into the development site this is the last uh, minute or so of what i'm going to say before um, we move on and um, the to the furthest right of that drawing you can see we've highlighted the thicket mead roundabout as an area where there may be need for um, enhancements and also that black dotted line showing the potential walk and cycle route to the to the um, greenway. So if you move on to the next slide, please. This is a very simple indication of the walking and cycling routes round the, and through the site with the yellow dotted lines and the red solid lines, which are in this case public rights of way, which will retain and enhance as, as part of bringing the development forward. So in conclusion, we're working through a transport assessment it's by no means finished, but the objective is to support, support sorry, sustainable travel and also make sure that there are no significant issues associated with road traffic. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And as you could move on um, a slide or two, please. Thank you. So we, I just thought it'd be useful to, to touch on what we see as a few of the benefits um, which can come out from the delivery of this List local development order. Um, we're absolutely focused on positive, positively and proactively shaping a sustainable form of development here. Uh, this scheme can create um, at least 1,300 jobs with a range of types of jobs um, and a range of skills that, that can be required to, to facilitate those jobs. And that is a significant economic in intervention on behalf of the council to, to support sustainable development within the Summer Valley. Um, but we're equally very mindful to ensure that any development that comes forward can work with uh, the local community and particularly thinking about the high street. So um, I touched on those, those retail and um, food and leisure uses. We, we see them as, as being able to be complementary to the town centre, but also helping to support um, the enterprise zone, the LDO, and therefore um, helping to introduce and, and create those new job opportunities. Um, as I've touched on, we are looking at a highly sustainable form of development, um, looking to um, align to the emerging policies around biodiversity net gain and net zero carbon. Um, and as Ed's talked about, really focusing on um, sustainable modes of transport, but equally making sure that the scheme uh, works, it's effective, um, and that there isn't any um, undue impact on that, um, that existing community. Um, and if I can, if you go on to the final couple of slides, please. So just in terms of timelines, uh, we thought it'd be helpful to set this in the context of the local plan partial update. And you can see that we are working on very similar timeframes, um, but we will go through this consultation over the next couple of months. Um, that will inform um, our design review. And in parallel with that, um, Ed and his team are undertaking more detailed highways assessments and having discussions with the local highways authority. Um, and um, all being well, we therefore expect to be able to complete that design development work um, following further consultations with the planning authority uh, with a view to submitting the LDO for, um, to go through its formal and statutory consultation uh, and then looking at adoption um, sort of uh, quarter two, quarter three in 2022. Um, and the final slide, please. So uh, thank you for listening tonight. Um, welcome any questions um, as ever following the, following the last of the presentations. Um, if there are any um, immediate questions or, or feedback um, outside of today, there's an email address there, consultationevents.southwest at eu.jll.com, in which you can contact us. Um, and then from the, on the 27th of September, we will be holding a public web, uh, webinar, and that will be advertised extensively for the local communities. And that will be an opportunity for um, for the, for the wider community to come um, hear our proposals. We'll, we'll have a little more time to talk in detail about the scheme. Um, and I'll have some of my colleagues from the design team with me to, to go into um, some of the specifics as, as to how those design elements are working. Um, and that will effectively open up a, a 28 day period of public consultation, where we will very much welcome feedback. Um, all the information will be on the council's website and will be available by various other means. Um, we've written to the, lo to the local 
um, residents and to the parish councils and made them aware. So we, we are seeking to go uh, far and wide in terms of um, seeking people's views and opinions as we, as we bring forward this LDA. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, um, Kevin. Chair. Thanks, Sorry, Simon. Yeah, you carry on. Yeah, thank you. Chair, I'm just um, conscious of your timetable and um, the number of questions. And I was just going to ask a question. Would you like us to pause there and you um, cover your question and answer? And we can bring the last part back to the next forum around how we saw these opportunities drawing together as a more kind of program based approach approach to future investment opportunity or would you like me to carry on I'm just very conscious of the of the meeting time and whether you want to use the last 10 minutes or so for your Q&A um, in light of some of the rather incredible statements made made about the enterprise zone I'm sure that a lot of the people present will want to ask some questions in fact I've got a very impressive list um, but I think we ought to hear the end of your presentation in case that generates some more. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'll continue. That's absolutely fine. Um, I just wanted to check that with you first. So there's only a f actually a few slides, but I, I hoped what we've set out is you can see that um, there is a significant opportunity around drawing together these work streams into a more planned approach to how we um, engage and ensure that the opportunities through public funding are drawn together and deliver local outcomes that you're seeking and needing to achieve. If you flick onto the slide, um, what we've actually done is, you know, the council have worked and changed the way they work through COVID and we've moved now from um, COVID responses through the pandemic to a COVID recovery phase where, as I outlined earlier, you know, significant grant support and business support has been provided. And we're moving now into a, a kind of a, a renewal phase where we want to engage and look at shaping a renewal vision for the local economy. The Council have formed an economic recovery and renewal board. I know a number of you have have, have been engaged and involved in that and some of the local stakeholders have been involved in in the consultation and engagement process that formed that strategy it was around a collective and partnership based approach for the new vision um, to create a vision that sets out a creates a fairer greener more creative and connected city region a region with bath more with northeast somerset than and northeast somerset and there were a number of proposals and plans that flow from that um, mechanism and what we'd like to do is use some of that to start to shape how we create a, a more um, planned investment program for not just not, not looking at the Soma Valley as a whole but for each community within the Soma Valley and they will all need different interventions and different ideas and different opportunities to come forward so if you move on through the slides um, what we want to try and do is to put a, a plan together that's perhaps more responsive to the specific geography within Bath and North East Somerset, um, to look at our current programmes again and encourage investment and stimulate wider involvement, identify new and more projects that we can deliver better place shaping and economic outcomes from, um, and better shape local delivery. Um, so, the idea is we, we, we just start to refocus how we engage locally and how we start to draw this together through some funding opportunities, through some of the COVID recovery funding that government's made available through the West of England Combined Authority and through some of the economic funding packages that are now available. So if you move on to the next slide, please. Um, what we'd like to do is to work with you to take a, a more perhaps systematic approach to identifying the opportunities that you'd like us to focus on to scope some of those towards becoming more real and more live projects much like the sort of love high streets renewal has has generated and created a lot of investment from the opportunity around re-establishing the town square to work to create a more coherent delivery plan as Richard set out and to support you to provide the resources to realize some more positive outcomes 
So it's, it's, it's taking that plan led approach and setting it out so we can get some funding to start to develop this. If you move on, please, Sarah. Um, as you know, we've already got a number of projects um, underway down in the, in the Soma Valley. They're not all just focused in Midsummer Norton. You know, Radstock Living, Healthy Living Centre is on site in Radstock. Um, there's a broader sustainable transport programme underway. Um, and there's been some really successful green infrastructure program outcomes. So we've intervened and done a number of green infrastructure projects through, through, through um, the last few years. But what we'd like to do now is to think, well, how, how do we use these and start to shape a future program? So if you move forward, um, please. So, so what we're suggesting is that, is that through the autumn, we work to try and, with key stakeholders, try to try and scope this into a bit more of a plan based approach to the delivery of interventions to start to identify and provide a bit more resource from within the council that is funded externally to help us do it, to start a, a wider engagement programme again, and Richard mentioned this at the beginning, to, to be a bit more planned about how we intervene and then how we coordinate these so that we can establish a plan that is available to, to, um, to future funding opportunities um, and that can then help us to start to sort of glue the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle like Soma Valley Enterprise Zone like the investment in the in the high street and connections to South Road car park and and then broadening out to some of the green infrastructure connections through to Radstock and Westfield and beyond down to um, Farrington Gurley and uh, through to the A37 so I think it, this was just this is just a suggestion, and what we were seeking was to start to, to get gather ideas and and for you to help us shape this into a proposition that we know we can draw some funding in to enable us to to bring a plan together if that's what you would like us to do. So that was really the end of the presentation, and we can jump back to the Q and A as I as I see chair. There are a lot of questions raised from the. Same with Ali presentation. Okay, well, I'd like to thank uh, Simon and Kevin for putting forward their, their uh, presentation. Very interesting infill. And um, we have got a crammed book of people asking for questions, which I'll take, if you like, in order. Um, I've got some questions myself, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually uh, ask my questions at the end of the questions, if you like. So can I ask first, Michael Evans, to come up and ask your question. Thank you, Chair. Um, two very short questions, one for Richard Dayon. Can you confirm um, our, our centre and to the town park, actually, which has very limited parking space, that there is no scope in the uh, updated local plan to uh, release any of the South Road car park land for residential or other buildings. And adding on to that theme, could I ask of uh, Ed Whitney, um, you're looking at 1300 jobs on the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone site. How many parking spaces are envisaged? Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Uh, thank you, Michael. No, I'll answer those uh, with the first question. Uh, Unfortunately, you, you sort of froze partway through your, your question, but um, basically yeah, I can confirm that the, the current evidence we've got is suggesting there is, there is as things stand, there's no scope to release uh, car parking uh, spaces from the South Road car park. Um, so for residential or, or other uses. However, we have made reference in the partial update to keeping that situation uh, under review, uh, you know, particularly in light of obviously the council's um, declaration of a climate emergency. Um, you know, it may be we relook at uh, charging policy, for example, in relation to in relation to that car park, uh, and then that may entail uh, a review of the number of spaces and and the, and the role that car park plays in the longer term. But certainly. Current evidence shows that in the, in, in the short to medium term, we need the current number of spaces in that car park. Thank you. Thank you. And um, 
With respect to the amount of um, car parking proposed within the enterprise zone, um, we've been through a process of identifying what the correct or what the appropriate amount to provide would be. And we're, we're not um, where we are in, 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 in the county um, provided with um, current parking standards, which is applicable in the planning process. Um, and so we've conducted a review of parking standards in other areas, such as in North, North Somerset, Dorset, and uh, the Bath Outer um, standard. We looked at average, minimum, and maximum um, standards produced with each, within each of those documents. Um, and we've um, made an assumption around different land uses being able to share parking spaces because they're operating in non-conflicting hours. So for example, a pub, would have its um, or, a, or a restaurant might have its parking demand in a different period to an industrial land use. And where we've arrived at in terms of uh, quantity of spaces is, is around between 700 and 750 is the, is the number um, at, the, at the present time. Um, as I say, we're, we're working with highways officers and um, we'll, they'll have their view on that, but that, that's currently our estimation. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask my questions at the end, but um, in the light of what Michael's just asked and your answer, I'd like to ask where the devil you got the idea that your proposals would employ 1,300 people. I'm involved with the factory, which I'm not willing to take any any more about, involving 398 people that I couldn't move here because of transport limitations. How the hell are you going to generate 1,300 people when the biggest area on the site is a storage and distribution network? That'll encourage trucks, cars, vans, and not many people. So is that, is that a question about the, the estimated number of jobs that we bring into the area or well, the amount of traffic it would generate? Absolutely. Cars, employment, and the number of uh, uh, commercial vehicles that that will generate, that, that style of building. The biggest business on that site is a storage and distribution one. So if I might start with that, and then other, others may, may step in. I, I talked about the range of, of types of uses here. So, so the, the single largest building um, is, is, yes, a, a storage and distribution use, as you'd expect for that type of use. But if we look at the other uses on there, there's a mixture of um, of offices, general industrial, and then those um, retail leisure type uses. And it's that combination of uses on the site um, which, which enable that number of jobs to be um, created or, or in theory would, would, would be created. And that's been tested as part of the, the business case process and, and through an assessment of floor area against job creation per square meter. In terms of the parking or transport elements, Ed, Ed may wish to add to that. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so you're absolutely right. You know, a, a, any development and not least a large development like this one will generate lots of trips and those trips will be will differ by by the land use. And some of the land uses will generate more trips than others. And some of the land uses will generate trips which which are more likely to be motorized traffic trips like HGVs or cars than others. Um, what we need to do as part of the transport assessment is identify how many trips we're generating associated with these land uses and test the extent to which the existing network can withstand that extra demand. And if we find that the extra demand pushes the existing network over and above what it can cope with, we must introduce, the planning process insists that we introduce mitigation measures to offset those disbenefits. So that's essentially the approach that we will take in response to the trips generated by the different land uses. Okay, well, more about the land uses than when it comes to my question. But I've got to say to you, 1,300 employees have to come from the area that they're being asked to walk or cycle from, which presumes that 1,300 people are already employed and trained in similar jobs. How do you condone that? I, I, I don't don't if that question was a transport question I don't I don't follow it so could you could you restate it because I didn't follow how how um how it impacts on on getting to and from the site. 
It's not a, it's not a, a transport question at all. Okay. Thank you. It's a question that you say 1,300 jobs created. To fill those jobs, you have to have people who are capable of doing those jobs, presumably trained to do so. And there aren't 1,300 people in, trained in those style of jobs in this area looking for employment. So they'll have to travel in, but you're telling us they have to cycle or walk. Can you explain that, that differential? May, may right. I come in there, please, Chair? Ed, can I come in there, if I, if yeah. I, if I may? Go ahead. Sorry, um, Chair, the, one, of, one of the aims is is to stop the, or to try and reduce the amount of out commuting from Midsummer Norton into um, into uh, other locations, and that's that, that's one of the, the, the aims of, of the introduction of the, of the enterprise zone is to is to retain those uh, jobs within within the local community. I hear I hear your point um, in relation to uh, those those people being trained. I, I can't go into details of a particular operator, but we are talking to a particular operator. Who has identified that in terms of the skills sets that they want for, for a production facility uh, in in the enterprise zone, they very much see that um, the skill set they require is 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 in Midsummer Norton and in the Summer Valley. Um, so we our expectations are that those those skills can be generated and can be developed um, in the uh, in uh, through through the occupiers and the employment use is taking place on site. The other thing I suppose that is also worth saying is that we have a very good local college um, at uh, in Radstock um, and there will be significant skills that, and there will be a, a cross play between skills development um, and um, employment on the enterprise zone. And we're working very closely with our business and skills team um, to develop um, a set of interventions which allow and enable people to be upskilled in the particular um, skills that will be required for the occupiers on site. Now, we, we haven't got that mapped out fully because we're too early in the process, but with the occupier I was talking about, we are working closely with our occupier now to think about how we develop and, and putting in place um, a training program that enables those skills to be developed and kept local. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm aware of the time frame, so can I ask for the next question, which is down on my list is Eleanor Jackson. I... <clears throat> Do you want all the questions all at once, or um, sh shall I take them as under the different subject headings? But I think it's absolutely outrageous that we have an officer state uh, talking about a college in Radstock when in fact it's in Westfield, and all the slides that we've been shown, only one had Westfield on it. Um, and, it, you know, if you're not aware of a really important community, which is historically uh, an enterprise and skills zone in its own right with um, self-generating businesses and inventions, um, you know, I'm really rather annoyed, quite frankly, as the ward member for Westfield, and I imagine um, a chair is as well. However, the questions are, uh, first of all, it's an admirable uh, concept about walking and cycling, but it's not much good if we've got, uh, I, I mean, I wonder what you're going to do about, shall put it diplomatically, what are you going to do about the state of the roads, the potholes, and the fact that in many areas, and particularly in Westfield, but also, dare I say, it, in Redstock, um, you can't get along the pavement because of the vegetation overgrowing it, and that includes vegetation from council sites. Um, second, so uh, what are you going to do about improving walking and cycling facilities? Secondly, um, I've done a lot to try and, and so has Councillor Hardman, to support the 82 bus, which runs between, oh, well, it, this is one of the issues. Can we do anything to get the full bus route restored? Uh, as it's now on a shortened route, but it goes through to Tining in Radstock. And I'm asking, um, that and other local rural bus services, is it possible for you to cooperate with Wiltshire and with Somerset? Because many of them cross county boundary lines and it seems as a, an issue about getting them subsidised. So can you do anything about that? Second, uh, thirdly, I'm delighted uh, to hear about the Economic Board 
uh, I was wondering if you might consider reinstating what used to be called the Red Stock and Westfield Task Force, which was very local, but which was a dialogue between members of the council, both officers and councillors, and local businessmen. And I think, uh, you know, would you consider putting that back? Um, but the thing I think I'm most concerned about is that, um, and Councillor Hardman can probably talk more about this, is the fact that time and again, we have a major development, but there's nothing of community benefit. Uh, consequently, on the Purnell site, we've lost the prospect of an um, old people's home. The same applies to the uh, what do you call it, Fosway South site, and even, dare I say it, odd down in um, Bath, we've lost three major sites that could have provided adult social care residentially for those who need it. So I'm wondering what you're going, you know, are you, are you going to make any provision and in all these plans for community facilities. That's your lot. That's your weather forecast. Uh, yes, uh, Richard Doohan needs to talk to you about this uh, somehow. Uh, can you answer us briefly, Richard? Yeah, I can pick up, pick up the last um, question. I, I think in terms of community facilities, obviously I did reference the early years education facility on the, on the Purnell site, enabling delivery of that, and, and that, that is a community facility. But in terms of um, elderly persons uh, accommodation, that, to be honest, is something that we need to address through, uh, from a planning perspective, through the preparation of the new local plan. Uh, and we will be um, looking to collect evidence uh, around both the, the need or demand for that type of accommodation across the district, also looking at you know, the current supply of accommodation um, and the longevity of that and, and condition of that supply, and then really looking to uh, help develop a strategy uh, as, as to where future provisions should be made. And the local plan will be able to potentially identify and allocate sites to help facilitate that delivery. So the short answer is, is it's not something we're, we're addressing through the partial update because that's Addressed, addressing some specific focused issues, but we will be looking at it through uh, through the new local plan in uh, conjunction with both communities and our colleagues in uh, adult services. Thanks, uh, Chair. I could just add to that. I mean, I'm glad you know I, I intentionally highlighted the point towards the end um, that you know we do need to recognise the individual um, contributions of each community. Um, specifically around plans um, and ideas that you know, Westfield um, and you know where the college is and the other industry and um, creativity that's gone on historically in Westfield, how that can contribute. So Eleanor's suggestion of you know reinstigating the task force, I think that might be very welcome and I'd like to follow up on that. So perhaps that's something we could sort of discuss and move forward. Um, on the maintenance issues, um, there are, we we're working, and if Phil is still on the call, um, there is a regional settlement. So um, uh, we are expecting in the autumn statement um, to get a significant investment in transport maintenance and improvement. Um, and the council already allocates a significant amount of capital to pothole filling and maintenance. That's likely to increase. And we have a very good system actually of reporting potholes. So it's that, and the online portal to do that, we could perhaps share the link and, and send it round. But actually we've been really f effective where we, where we know about potholes, potholes are often filled and responded to very quickly. So if there are particular locations that are particular hotspots of, of concern on the highway network um, in, in your wards, then that is definitely something that through that mechanism, we can actually track and monitor and respond to pothole filling very quickly now. Um, and, and we're doing that very effectively across the district. Um, and I think, you know, just highlighting the last point um, on the adult and social care, I think it's a combination that um, the council is looking to be more active, particularly in social housing delivery, and we are preparing a, 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 you know, a social affordable housing delivery plan. And that is very much picking up some of those market failure points, Eleanor, around the fact that the market doesn't deliver certain aspects of adult social care, particularly in terms of the care provision um, and um, 
and uh, and accommodation and affordable accommodation. And we are trying to start to pull together a plan that looks to address that very specifically in locations of need in the district. So where they are identified in the plan process, we can start to have a, pr a, a program where we can look at investing and developing those sites or those locations to meet that need. So I think there are plans in place, um, but I do take your point that we need to be responsive and receptive to how the different communities um, want to see um, opportunities brought forward, be it Westfield or Radstock or Poulton or Midsummer Norton. Um, and I think we, we, we're keen to engage on that basis. Thank you, Chair. Okay, can I jump in then um, and say that, um, look, I'm gonna be the big bad chairman and say that we're running disastrously over time. Um, a lot of very vociferous questions, I think, are needed and need long answers. So I'm suggesting that anybody who's on my list, if I call you out and you uh, have a question that's, that's considerably long or would like to meet with people, you contact Sarah or Alison by email and they'll make sure that you're put in touch and those um, holes, uh, those um, arguments can be put forward face to face if necessary, or maybe even ask the people to come to the next meeting. So let's quickly move on. If you haven't got a, if you if you can do that, please do. Let us know straight away. So right now, the next person on my list is Demian Valentine. Um, yeah, this is, I'm going to keep this short. Um, I would like to, uh, I would like to have spoken to uh, Phil Wright, but obviously he's uh, left now. Uh, but also, um, Councillor Richard Samuel, um, you raised a point that I share about the public transport in the area is not um, that great, and for a lot of because uh, I live in Timsbury, uh, so we have a terrible bus service along the, the B3115. So I'm worried that this new corridor scheme is going to forget villages like us, and we're just going to be left with nothing, which is going to drive people to um, use cars, because where, where I am in Timsbury, walking or cycling to the A37 or the uh, A632, that's not an option, because there's hills, and um, what do you do when you get there? You can't just leave your bike in a by the bus stop uh, and people aren't fit enough to do it and it's just not feasible so people are either going to drive or just not go anywhere which means these villages are going to be cut off so um clive turner and i were discussing a uh, proposal uh before covid hit um to to run a, a direct service between bath and wells that would keep these villages connected the idea was you got two uh two important uh, popular destinations on each end of the route, but also keep the villages uh, in the middle connected with a sustainable bus service. And we had a lot of interest from uh, James Freeman, who's now left First Bus and other bus companies in the area. And obviously COVID hit, so we didn't get too far with this as a proposal, but it's something that we think would fit in very well with this corridor scheme that is being considered. So we, we would like this proposal to be considered along with um, what, what's gonna happen uh, next in the future for local buses. Yeah, may I uh, speak, uh, Chair? Uh, just to endorse what Damien is saying there, um, doing some quick research, it, it looks unfortunately that if this consultation, looking at the two main corridors of the A37 and the A367, do not take into account what I am calling the Forgotten Valley i.e. the B3115, the Cam Valley, which actually has in the region of approximately 7,000 inhabitants. It cannot be accepted that we must make our way to those two main corridors. It, it's just not feasible, uh, geographically, topographically, uh, and everything else. Uh, demographically, it will not work. So, we're making this point now so that when the consultation, and sadly, Mr. Wright has gone, when the consultation does properly kick off, it is not restricted only to look at the A37 and the A367. That's all I've got to say. Thank you yeah, very much. I'm sure you're not Mary Turner, but still. No, funny that. Um, it's my wife's computer because mine decided not to play. Um, so I'm incognito. No, it's Clive Turner. Cl okay, Clive. I know that. Um, can we move on quickly then, please? Liz Hardman. 
I'm going to be unusually brief for me, uh, but I do want to say something because the Silver Valley Enterprise Zone is totally in my ward in Poulton. And just that well, many of us are very concerned about the fact that there is a change of use. The, the use is changing from being your typical industrial estate, which would be good, solid, uh, full-time jobs, uh, into um, leisure and retail and food and drink, which we're told will be of higher value, which will support the development. Um, and many of these are low paid casual jobs. So just just that is my my one of my great concerns. And then the other one is to what extent will consultation be heeded? Because um, I have a feeling this local development order is set in framework is will be set in stone. It is the framework for development. Um, but I'm really concerned that um, many people in our area will not want this type of development, will want development, will want jobs. And secondly, may I make a plea, and I'm, I'm coming to an end now, I see this plan every so often, I can't get my hands on this plan. When this goes out to consultation, we need to see this plan, we need to see what actually is proposed, we need to see where the hotel is, we need to see the height of the buildings because we have our, our, um, our batch, our uh, local undesignated heritage asset, um, which is the old cold tump. Um, and we do need to preserve that. So just some very quick things, very concerned about the casual nature of the jobs. We're not going to deliver the good jobs we want in our area to cut out, um, out commuting in the area. And secondly, we do need to be assured that consultation will be taken on board, um, especially when it comes to um, reviewing the design, the, the design review, and then make sure, please, that we get a plan. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Um, bear in mind what I said. Uh, email Sarah and Alison. I know you meet them anyway, but email them and give them a list of your concerns and see if they can help you in any way with those, that paperwork. Can I move now quickly on to um, Ryan Wicks, please? Uh, hello, yes, yeah, so I'll try and be as quick as possible. Um, so first, with the Summer Valley Enterprise Zone, and although we didn't mention it in your slide specifically, in the previous presentation about the Wecker Transport Corridor improvements, it was stated about um, improving walking and cycling from neighbouring villages to get to the A37. So I just find it quite bizarre that uh, with the Summer Valley Enterprise Zone, the funding, but Wecker pulled the funding the cycle lane to the A37, I just didn't seem like it's more joint up thinking. And I just want to um, reiterate again, I think it is important to um, uh, reassess that, particularly as that as the funding was pulled prior to the climate emergency declarations uh, that were made. Um, and then the couple more specific questions I had was um, with regards to the pinch point at Sunnyside, extending the road there, something I'm supportive of that and these other measures been found to go any are things I'm sort of of and I think they're much needed improvements but um, while we're extending the road outside of Sunnyside we have been told by highways before that the parked cars there act as an informal traffic calming measure so I wondered sort of what if any evaluation is going to be made into um, sort of introducing in something new to um, prevent the traffic coming into the village too fast because of course while that is extended, it does remove that informal traffic calming measure. Um, and then lastly, um, I just wondered with the hotel, um, how confident are we with the viability of the hotel? I was just a bit con little concerned because with the rise of Airbnb these days, it is putting a lot of businesses, you know, B&Bs and hotels as they are struggling as a result. And I just thought, considering Summer Valley isn't a large tourist area how confident are we that it is going to be you know a very well used uh, hotel thanks should i come in on the transport related questions chair Go ahead. Yeah. yeah okay so um with respect uh, taking the the sunny side pinch point um first you're quite right that it does um that intervention would regulate the flow of traffic um, and, and thus remove the, the necessity for, for some vehicles to stop and, and give way. And you're absolutely right that it's essential that in doing so, we don't, you know, accidentally um, introduce conditions whereby traffic speeds increase too much to the detriment of, of local people and, and safety. And so on that basis, um, we're going to undertake a road safety audit which will examine that issue 
Um, and in the event that the road safety audit finds yet yeah, speed will increase beyond a certain point uh, to be unacceptable, we would then it would be our obligation actually in, in the design rules to to address that issue. Um, with respect to the cycle connection to Farrington Gurney, it may well be something that Weka um, will examine um, itself um, in, in the future, noting that the point that um, Phil Wright made, you know, it might be might be the kind of intervention that they would consider would um, support and supplement what uh, they're talking about bus services on the A37. Um, specifically with in connection with the with the Summer Valley Enterprise LDO, however, in planning terms, we have found that introducing that kind of measure would only very in a very small way introduce uh, additional walking and cycling trips from, from Farrington Gurney and the amount of trips that it would generate from walking and cycling um, it would be too low to justify the amount of investment. Um, our expectations around investment and um, and the increase in, in number of trips will be set out in the documentation that accompanies the LDO, but we're confident at this point in time that the, that the business case simply isn't there for that measure, uh, and indeed that the feasibility of doing so would require land acquisition that would be beyond our capabilities in, in, in addressing. And, and sorry, Chair, may I just come in on that one, just one further point, just to supplement Ed's response as well. Uh, 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 Councillor Wills, we, we, that is a point that we will, however, be picking up with, with the worker because it, it, it may be that um, originally the, 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 the economic benefits, the, the, the business case ratio, the kind of the cost benefit ratio don't stack up, but there may be an argument to have a further conversation with the worker in relation to their, um, their, their wider um, transport proposals um, around the A37, A367 corridor and the wider network. So there is a conversation to be had. And in fact, I do have a, I'm, I'm hoping to have a, a half hour with uh, Phil Wright this week to have a further conversation on that front as a, as a potential future delivery point. Just to come back on your point on, on the hotel um, delivery, the, the, the assessment to an extent is that that is more of a, a business location hotel. There is, there is um, to do two things. It, it, it supplements people who want to, um, who, who, who want to do a couple of things. They, they want to travel into Bath in due course, um, hopefully by sustainable means uh, to have meetings, but also there will be meetings that need to take place on the enterprise zone. Um, and, and, there, and often people want to stay overnight. And this, one of the aims is that this will be a business location uh, also. So for people who, who are coming in uh, on an individual basis um, who want to have meetings overnight can also stay there. But there is also a, a kind of, a, um, uh, there is a, an, an argument to say that, that, that a lot of the hotels in Bath are quite expensive um, and it may well be that there's a, there's a greater economy of scale and, and greater and cheaper room rates potentially um, if those people can stay um, in, in surrounding towns and villages where the cost of overnight accommodation may be less expensive. So the viability still needs to be fully tested. We have had some very early conversations. It was last year um, with hotel operators. Um, but uh, certainly that's something that we'll be looking at in quite some close detail. Okay, thanks. That's good answers, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ryan. And uh, it's, it, uh, a couple of other people who asked the questions, unfortunately they've left the, the site, so it's just down to me uh, to make a comment to the um, Enterprise Zone people. So, as a, an employer who was going to bring a 389 employee business to this area, but was advised by transport, heavy goods, aircraft tractors, in fact, was advised by a, a, a very knowledgeable uh, transport uh, system that it would cost me £165 a tonne more than a variety of other sites if I came to the Somer Valley because the road access was so pathetic and the time to get to a motorway. So um, please bear that in mind. There are, diff there are extreme difficulties with this area with road transport and the A362, frankly, is a disaster zone. If you can do something to improve that, I'll eat my hat, but let's see. And please keep us informed about what you're doing.
I think at that point we have to draw we have to draw an end to the uh, to this particular section. I think I'll hand you back to our chairman, um, who will um, who will take on from now. Linda, it's over to you. Thanks very much, Ron. I appreciate all you did, and thank you to all the speakers who came. We are now moving on to the AGM of our meeting. So if those speakers, if you'd like to leave, please do so. We won't be offended. But will everybody else please stay? Okay, because we need to be quiet for this. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Okay, no. Thank you, Richard. Right then. Um, so notes of the previous AGM meeting. Um, hopefully you've all had a copy and been able to have a quick look. Um, so the minutes were circulated with the papers. So there are no matters arising unless any of you wish to raise any. Edward, did you? Um... No, okay. Sorry, that was the perfect timing for me to say goodbye, but also to look like I was um, raising something. <laughs> um, but I, I'm actually heading off, but I just wanted to say thank you ever so much. And uh, please feel free to email me at midsummernorthamhaz at barthes.gov.uk if you'd like to um, discuss anything Midsummer and Autumn related. Thank you. Okay, see you at the next meeting. Bye. Righty ho then. So, um, are there any matters arising from the um, minutes of the last mm. AGM? No. no. Okay, brilliant. Then I'll move on to the item six. Um, the chair's annual review was circulated with the papers. It was just a note for you to have a look at. Um, so I wasn't planning on going through it now. Um, everybody happy with that? Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay. Ron, did you have anything to say something here for an annual review? Briefly, I would love to say something, Chairman, but COVID really, really uh, stopped me doing that. So good luck to everybody and let's look forward to the next few years. Yeah, I agree with you totally. I really do. OK, so we'll move on again then. Um, item seven, review and amend if required the terms of reference. Now, um, we have had uh, two suggestions for new members. One is the Summer Valley Food Bank. And the other is PSI Hive, PSJ Hive, sorry. Um, does anyone disagree with them joining the forum? No, so we're all happy with that. Okay, so we can go ahead. Yeah? Yeah, get in touch with them and let them know that that's fine. And does anyone want to make any more suggestions now of people who could join us? No? No. OK, then we'll move on. Um, I hand over to Sara now because it's uh, to um, election of the chair and the vice chair. OK, so off we go. Thank you. Thanks to Linda and Ron and, and particularly thanks to them both tonight because it was a, a very long meeting. But I think you'll all um, uh, agree that it was a very important and, and useful discussion. So I know we've run on a little bit tonight, but um, thanks for chairing it so well, both Linda and, and Ron. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank them both um, as chair and vice chair that um, the forums don't require their, their attendance at just this meeting. They require their attendance at other meetings outside of this to help shape the agendas and make sure that we have issues that are brought to the forum that are topical to you all. So thanks to them both for their, um, whilst it's been short for Ron, their, their chairing and involvement in the forum this, this, uh, this year. Um, we've had only two nominations um, uh, one for the vice, uh, sorry, one for the chair and one for the vice chair, which is re-election of Linda Robertson and uh, Ron Hopkins as vice chair. Um, I'm assuming we haven't had anything else for this evening. I'm assuming nobody else would like to stand. So I'm taking that silence as those two nominations we will take a vote on. We have a poll. We're going to do something a bit different um, because we're doing this virtually. We have a poll which Alison is going to launch um, mm. now, which is um, our voting. So if you would be happy to vote, um, whether you agree with the re-election of Linda and Ron as um, chair and vice chair, I'll give you a moment to, um, <laughs> to respond. Linda, you can do it as well. So um, if you want me to do that on, while you're here, are you happy? Yes, 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 that's fine. So hopefully, 
Have we got enough votes? Mm -hmm. So, Alison, do you want to tell us what the, or can you share the, um, maybe I'll share it. Did you say share? Tell us what they are. Tell us the results. Polling. There we go. Share results. There we go. Oh, there we are. <laughs> so, thankfully, they've all been voted back in and it's very straightforward. So, thanks very much. Hope that wasn't too difficult. Um, and uh, thanks, thanks again to them both and um, other members of the forum. I know it's been a bit difficult over this last year or so, but I think um, doing it by Zoom, um, we have been able to engage more people um, and we hope to do a bit of a mix of forum by Zoom and hopefully when we can do meet in person as well. So thanks very much and back to Linda. Sarah, okay. Sarah, can I just make a comment, please? There are a lot of people tonight, obviously very concerned about the Summer Valley, develop, Summer Valley uh, development, um, including Liz quite, Liz, quite rightly, because of where it's located. We'll, we will, I will talk to Linda and to Alison and Sarah and see what we can do to get as much information in writing for you to read, and uh, we'll work out ways of circulating it. Yes. It is really a very important thing, especially if they're talking about 1,300 jobs which I don't believe, but that's, that's, a, that's a matter of point, but still. No, there we go. And we'll thank you, and thank you for your votes. Thank you for your votes. We'll circulate the presentations of the meeting um, after, afterwards, so sometime this week, so you'll get a copy of those after the meeting. And this meeting is being recorded, and it will be uploaded onto YouTube, so people will, you'll be able to share it with your colleagues, um, and people will be able to look at it again um, and so we'll, so we'll make sure that's available as soon as we can get the information up and uploaded onto the website. So uh, thanks very much. Over to Linda. Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, and thank you for the votes. Um, it's brilliant. So uh, Ron and I have been sort of getting together to work well. So we'll keep going down that path. Um, right, so we've got one item left, the dates of the next meeting. So we've got a meeting planned for the 7th of October. And that's a joint meeting with Chew Valley Forum, and it's on the theme of health and well-being. Now, the rationale for this is that the Three Valleys Health Primary Care Network covers nine GP practices, and that's all in the Chew and the Summer Valley areas. So the fact that they're working together will bring a lot more information to us. So I think that's going to be really information, really interesting. Uh, we also have scheduled a meeting on Thursday, the 25th of November. That's at six o'clock too. It will be a special meeting about Bain's council budget meeting. And that again is going to be a Zoom meeting. And we do intend holding the future forum meetings, generally speaking online, um, but hoping to have one or two, at least physical meetings per year. Um, I much prefer face-to-face -face meetings, but we have to be realistic on how we can do things. So that's how things are being planned at the moment. So hopefully we'll see and um, see you all on the 7th of October. And so all I'll say now is thank you for coming tonight and take care of yourselves, please. And uh, we'll see you then. Okay, cheery bye.